Heart Mental Health Foundation, uh, which focuses on providing treatment for children, young people, and adults with mental health problems in a multidisciplinary setting. He works with a team of 16 other really fantastic professionals, and uh, that center mm -hmm. is recognized as a center of excellence. Um, uh, apart from this formal introduction, he's a very dear friend and one of the few people that whom I admire, and a very articulate gentleman. Apart from just psychiatry, it's it's uh, really a pleasure to have a chat with him because he's quite well rounded in his perspective of the world. So uh, it's a professional as well as a personal privilege to have Dr. Ram uh, teach us a little bit about uh, ADHD. Uh, he had told me that he'll be talking about it from a very different perspective and it won't be a typical uh, didactic lecture format, but uh, he's going to be giving us a different uh, way of looking at it. Uh, so, uh, I'm sure all of us will enjoy the talk and uh, without any further ado, I will invite Dr. Ram to take over the proceedings and uh, which will be followed by a short Q&A. Uh, either you can send in your questions on the chat or if Dr. Ram so desires, uh, you can have a direct conversational uh, interaction with him as well. Right? Over to you, Dr. Ram. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. For the Am I audible? Uh, yes, you are. You are. Yeah. Thank you, Rashmin. Uh, thank you for a very generous introduction. I uh, wish my wife, uh, I could record it and kind of uh, you know, <laughs> feedback. <laughs> she, yeah. She, done would, done that. <laughs> she would strongly disagree on the well-rounded personality part. I'm absolutely sure. So, uh, no, but it's a privilege, really. I really looked forward to going to Bombay and kind of going to Mumbai and doing this in person. Uh, but I think such is the reality now and I think I, I am not very, I'm gradually warming up to the webinars and I think this is the <clears throat> way to go. Um, so thank you for that generous introduction. What I will, you know, Bob, what I will do is, as Rashmin said, uh, I'm just uh, sharing my screen just... Uh, Is my screen now visible to everyone? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. You know, my uh, aim, I, when I spoke to Rashmin and when I have been to Mumbai for the PG lectures, uh, I'm aware that most of the people who tune in are uh, fresh postgraduates and, you know, uh, making their mark in the uh, world of psychiatry, uh, in the rough and tumble and getting their hands and feet dirty. So what I am actually going to do is, I will try and uh, share how I think when someone who presents with maybe ADHD uh, comes to us. When I say us, I have really have the privilege of working with uh, 16 fantastic professional and my aim has always been to let them do the hard work and uh, me taking the credit so i will i have about 25 26 slides and in which i am hoping to share my ideas regarding how i formulate my thinking around adhd Rather than tell you it has got one person prevalence five percent prevalence this is the gender difference this is the you know, facts and figures and biology. Uh, I would like to share rather how I formulate my thinking, how I process the information which is given to me and we progress in our management of the family and the child. So, hence uh, this title that thinking like a child psychiatrist. I know it sounds a bit pejorative. Uh, many adult psychiatrists are also capable of thinking uh, I think I will be lynched uh, in the live CME group, but uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, we like the rough and tumble of live CME. So the name of the presentation basically implies that, um, you know, I'm not going to give you facts and figures because I believe that, you know, you can get information from anywhere. Uh, but I'm hoping I would be able to influence the way 
the young psychiatrists think. And I think that is more important. So you can have the facts and figures from everywhere. But if as a senior person who has been in the field, if I'm able to influence even slightly the way you process information, uh, I think my job is done. So, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have heard uh, this category of uh, knowledge uh, that there was a guy called Donald Rumsfeld. He was the defense secretary when 9-11 uh, happened. Uh, he was a very senior politician, bureaucrat in USA. And in one of the live press conferences, when after the bombing, of uh, World Trade Center, one of the journalists asked uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who was the defense secretary and field representing White House, that he said that we know that uh, Osama bin Laden is hiding in the caves of Bora Bora uh, in, in Afghanistan. So why hasn't the US military uh, got there and killed him? So then Donald Rumsfeld, I, I was seeing that uh, interview. You know, I was seeing him live on that interview uh, in CNN. And then Donald Rumsfeld paused for about, say, 30 seconds and said, which I always will remember and has helped me in formulating my own way of thinking about knowledge. He said that, you know, knowledge and information, they have a variety of categories. One is known and known. That is, we know what we know. So... We know that sun rises in the east. We know that uh, sun sets in the west. So there are certain knowledges, information, which we know we know. So that's known, known. The other part is unknown, unknown. We don't even know that we don't know this. So that it is to be known, we don't know. So it's an unknown, unknown. And there is something called known unknown, that I know that I don't know this. And my purpose today is to increase the young psychiatrist's knowledge about known unknown. So I would like to point out certain things which hopefully will be, you know, remaining in your brain and you will seek further information in that field. And I think the whole process after we qualify, the whole process of learning is that, that I follow one of the uh, WhatsApp-based discussion groups, which is really very active. And there is a minefield of information there. So what it helps me, in the way it helps me really, is that I find out that I don't know this. So I know that I don't know this. And I think in our learning, in our practice, it is very important to be aware of what we don't know so that we can go and learn that later. And that is what you know, lifelong learning is. So the way I have formulated these, uh, this presentation of around ADHD is with a series of questions which we need to answer, formulate our responses and then it will be you know helpful for us to manage ADHD. Uh, most of you will be incredibly uh, disappointed with this list. You will see that what a waste of time really. He's not covering anything. Uh, but what is not covered is I haven't covered, I won't be talking about etiology, I won't be talking about long-term outcome of ADHD, I won't be talking about evidence-based treatment modality modalities. I won't be talking about something which is a very favorite topic of mine, uh, links with bipolar mood disorder and ADHD. Pharmacotherapy, I'm not covering it here, but hopefully we will have ample time to have question and answers about uh, pharmacotherapy. But as a measure of, you know, reconciliation so that I'm not bombarded with abuses, I will share some of my favorite uh, <clears throat> favorite references with you there are there is a list of five references which i would share and i hope that it is somewhere in the slides but otherwise i will post it immediately after uh, the presentation is over and those five references if you read 
will prepare, you know, you will know almost everything about ADHD that is there to know. Uh, those are very brief references. The full text articles are available everywhere. If not, you let me know and I will send it to you. So let us kind of go through what I'm going to talk about. So what is, what is our real challenge? That how do we diagnose ADHD? When a child comes to us with symptoms presenting with ADHD, how do we diagnose? So that's important. I personally feel it's also very important to be aware that how we should not diagnose <clears throat> and we will have some discussion about that because I think a lot of us take a very checklist approach, rely too much maybe on psychometry and corners and you know, do not take a systemic view when we diagnose ADHD. So how not to diagnose ADHD, I feel is also important. Then there is this whole conundrum of whether whatever the child is presenting to us, uh, how do we unravel, how do we unpick the differential diagnosis or the comorbidity? And what is the importance of the above points? Then, once we have a child and a family presenting with ADHD, how do we unpeel the different complex bits which present to us? Keeping in mind the fact that research after research papers, review articles, clinical experience have shown to us that simple bondor ADHD does not come to us. Remember, help seeking, psychiatric help seeking, that too for children in India, it is a very difficult task. Most people, you know, who come to seek help from a mental health professional regarding their children are having to give up their time, earning, energy. So therefore, the cohort of cases which comes to us always invariably have comorbidity. So therefore, how do we unpeel the diagnosis of which part is which? Then obviously, this is a no-brainer really. Why you should diagnose correctly? Because if you don't diagnose correctly, you won't get the management right. Uh, I said I'm not going to talk about pharmacotherapy, but I think this, this is also important that as a clinician, as a psychiatrist, is pharmacotherapy the only thing which we have to offer? And the answer is obviously no. So therefore, what is your role? What is a psychiatrist's role in a child's life, in the family's life? which is experiencing ADHD. Then, what are the treatments you should be aware of? <clears throat> and we need to have a real in-depth knowledge of the evidence-based treatment, non-pharmacological treatment of ADHD, because as you know, particularly in a city like Mumbai, there are loads of other professionals who are also wanting to help children. And unfortunately, you know, despite our best intentions, we may not be providing evidence-based treatment. So when some special educator, some graphologist, some clinical psychologist, some counselor is providing some form of treatment, non-pharmacological treatment, to the child you are seeing in a clinic, I think it is obligatory on our part. It is obligatory on our part to inform the parents about the appropriate treatment modality and is it evidence-based. Finally, very briefly, what is the role of psychometry? And should we know about psychometry? Because I think that is also a very important part because I personally feel that 
if we ourselves do not know about psychometry, we will not really be able to work properly with our clinical psychology colleagues and work in partnership to achieve best for the child. So I personally think that it is important that we know about psychometry for children which are used in ADHD if you are managing a child with ADHD. <clears throat> right, so yeah, these are my favorite references and these are absolutely fantastic, you know, uh, journal articles which are easily accessible. So the number one is the European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in 2011 guideline on managing side effects of medication for ADHD. This is a, uh, really a fantastic article which talks about can you give methylphenidate to a child with epilepsy? Should you give atomoxetine? Uh, is Tourette's and methylphenidate, can you co-administer both drugs? And the variety of side effects, how you can manage more effectively. It has stood the test of time and it is really, I would implore all, all you know, uh, everyone to read this and it's easily available on the net. Uh, one of my favorite articles and one of my favorite researchers actually is this guy called Pharaon. Uh, it's a 2013 BJ Psych article on the relationship of ADHD and bipolar. It's a three-page article, but it's very, very interesting. It's a three-page review article. And again, it's worth reading. Uh, the third one is Pharmacological Management of ADHD, published by the British Association of Psychopharmacology. And it's published in 2014, Journal of Psychopharmacology. If there is one article which you need to read about knowing everything about uh, pharmacological management of ADHD, this is it. And you really don't know, need anything else. Then the fourth one is, again, a fantastic review. Uh, I'm sure many of you would know that nature reviews uh, are excellent publications with great deal of minute details on the diseases they cover. Uh, so the ADHD published in 2015 is no exception. In fact, their uh, piece on schizophrenia is also worth reading. Again, it's a, a short review. I think it's about 14 or 15 pages, but again, excellent state of the art uh, article on neurobiology, on uh, you know, the genetics of ADHD and the whole variety of other themes are also covered. Uh, I have deliberately given the last reference because we often feel, we often see uh, many preschoolers who are extremely hyperactive, restless. You know, you all have seen three or four year olds or children who have just started nursery and creating mayhem at home their homes or in their clinic or when they visit you in the clinic. So this article on Journal of uh, Child Psychology and Psychiatry, JCPP, uh, 2019. Again, it's a very elegant review on assessment and treatment. So uh, these are my references. And I feel that uh, if most of us read this, these few articles, we would have a fairly robust knowledge about almost virtually everything about ADHD that is we need to know. Right, so what is at the core of ADHD and ADD? So we know that these are the three you know, core features, hyperactivity, inattention, impulsivity. <clears throat> now, if as a trainee or if as a clinician, what do we need to know about the core features? What we need to know is how do these core features manifest? So if I just, if you allow me to go back, how does hyperactivity manifest? How does inattention manifest? How does impulsivity manifest? How does it manifest in a three-year-old child? How does it manifest in a seven-year-old child? How does impulsivity manifest in a 13 year old girl in contrast to a 15 year old boy. So these are the items which we need to know. It is, I feel 
it is very important to be aware of the gender differences in presentation of ADHD and also to have a lifespan approach of ADHD. That if you are seeing a six year old child or a four year old child with ADHD, will the features be same as someone who is a 16 or a 17 year old? I'm not going to foray into this whole area of adult ADHD because that's a different topic. But we need to have the awareness that manifestation of the core features of ADHD changes across the lifespan and we need to be cognizant of that. With children come to us, as I said, invariably children with comorbidity come to us. You know, most of the children you will see who come to us, present to us in our clinics have comorbidity. So therefore, my point is, we should not be just resting after diagnosing ADHD by your corners. You know, we need to be much more sensitive to what is happening in the child's life. We need to dig deeper because invariably in our experience, majority of children who come to us have comorbidities. <clears throat> Right. So I think if I just highlight on the second point here, which is uh, it is particularly evident in situations that require a child to be thoughtful and restrained. So many children, they might be able to sustain their attention while they are playing mobile games, while they are watching television for a brief period or something which interests them. But they may not be equally restrained and thoughtful in situations where attending the birthday party, in situation when they're supposed to quietly listen to something in a class or when a tutorial is happening. So therefore, I think it is very important to realize that a cross-sectional view of a child sitting quietly once or twice in a clinic or sitting quietly in a classroom during one particular lesson may not give you the entire picture. They have to be thoughtful, restrained, and this, you know, uh, if, you, if they don't have ADHD. So therefore, the symptoms will be quite wide ranging in a variety of settings. And the second part is, that their symptoms should interfere with their functioning and development. So if a child has ADHD, it should not only impact, have an impact on their learning process, learning skills, but it will also have, their, have an impact on his friendships, on his relationships, on his self-esteem. So, Having ADHD does not only mean that the child is falling behind in studies. You know, as most middle class Indians, most Indians put a great value on uh, education. So therefore, a lot of our conversation with the family, with the child, we really focus on the learning problems while we are talking to a child or talking to a family uh, while evaluating ADHD. But we also need to take a view about their friendships, about how this child's overactivity, impulsivity is affecting the family dynamics. If the child is a bit older, how the child's um, self-esteem being affected. So we need to take a much more 360 degree view of how the symptoms interfere with the child's functioning and development, and it is invariably affected. <clears throat> so it's very important to focus on this bit really, uh, that ADHD ultimately is a clinic based on a clinical evaluation, you know, uh, I'm sure many of you would know that 
corners, which is the long format of corners. And unfortunately, most uh, many clinicians rely on the short version of corners was designed to evaluate pharmacological response to drug treatment. ADHD is always a clinical diagnosis. Just because some of us mental health professionals have rated the child yes or no on some question on corners that does not rule out uh, ADHD or that also does not kind of rule in ADHD. I think I cannot overemphasize the fact. My point of saying this is please just don't rely on a corners to um, say that yes, this child is, has got ADHD. So it's a much more detailed clinical evaluation. When we are seeing a child with ADHD, we should also assess the parenting practices, you know, and their attribution of hyperactivity behavior and parental psychopathology. Because remember, ADHD has got significant genetic contribution. Therefore, if you are trying to work with a family where the father or the mother or unfortunately, both of them have ADHD, you will end up banging your head against the wall. So therefore, parenting practices, their attribution of hyperactive behavior, parental psychopathology is also something we need to keep in mind. Now, remember, this does not need to happen at one go. It's a gradual thing like unpeeling of an onion. It is a process in which we need to embark. Information from and about school is essential and a direct examination of the child is important. Having said this, uh, you know, I'm aware that many children who go to uh, government schools, often we don't have a feedback from them. So therefore I have written information about school is very important. What kind of school the child is going. Often the private tutors are able to fill up the information or the tutorial teachers will fill up the information in absence of school. But my point is that we should, you know, uh, employ every resource to get an independent opinion from a teacher or from a school or from a tutorial um, about the child, apart from talking to the child and talking to the family. You know, I, I personally do this a lot. I often put myself in the shoes of a 10 year old who hasn't been told anything. Uh, says that you're going to meet a doctor because you are a bad kid. And he's kind of dragged into my room, sees a bald, middle-aged, grim looking psychiatrist kind of gazing at him. And I invariably ask him that, you know, him or her, that why have you been brought? And you will be surprised uh, the kind of answers uh, you will get. In many situations, children are not told why they are brought. In many situations, they will give you answers which will really break your heart. Uh, saying that my mom has said that I'm driving her crazy and kind of I'm on the verge of suicide because of you. Why were you born? And such kind of, you know, really, really sad tales come out. I cannot overemphasize this point that, you know, we are all advocates for the child. And unless we understand their perspective of why they have been brought to us, however magnificent pharmacologist I am, However great understanding of the neurobiology of the brain I have, uh, I will be doing a disservice. You know, I will not be able to connect uh, with the child. Because I feel in child and adolescent mental health, our primary role, our primary role is to act as the advocate of the child. And unless we have a glimpse an understanding of this area, of their understanding of why they have been brought 
and their self-esteem, I think it would be impossible to, uh, you know, have a shared understanding with which we can work. I'll just switch on the... <laughs> then reading, writing, learning abilities, speech, uh, cognitive assessment is often very important, physical assessment of hearing, sight, coordination. You know, the many children have dyspraxia. Uh, there is this very popular Scandinavian concept, just Google Gilberg and Damp. Mm, you will, uh, you know, this is a unique concept, which is a Scandinavian concept, which unfortunately didn't get, gain much popularity uh, outside the Scandinavian countries. But uh, Damp is a concept which I think as practitioners, which we must know, uh, many children have problems in coordination. Uh, many children with ADHD are extremely emotional, uh, at least when they are brought to us initially. Uh, many of you would know that methylphenidate also increases emotionality in some children. So therefore, it's, I think emotionality is something, an important facet we need to uh, look into. Then also anxiety and depression. So... These are some of the things over and beyond the routine assessment which you will be doing, uh, we need to evaluate. But again, my request is that do engage with the child. Do keep the child at the center of your evaluation about how they feel, you know, about how they feel about their predicament. Because ultimately, the child has to understand the problem own the problem and try and deal with it. And that happens. It takes a lot of time, but it does happen. <clears throat> so my aim always is to get a complete picture of the child. You know, uh, what the child is, the child's ecosystem and uh, how the parents are responding, how the schools are responding. What kind of friends this child has? Is he, is he a kind of a truth tailor, a fish lover? Uh, Katrina Kaif is the child's favorite or is it kind of more Virat Kohli, Anushka Sharma, uh, K-pop, Arijit Singh, so everything to get a complete picture of the child. And remember, it, it is a long process. You know, it is a long process. It's more than one or two consultations. And my experience is majority of parents sign up to it. So don't be feeling awkward that, you know, you will be charging it's the economic burden of the, on the uh, family members. Uh, psychiatric evaluation, psychiatric treatment doesn't really cost that much if you compare the lifelong impact on detrimental effect ADHD can have the, on the child's life. So if we do the evaluation properly, it can be life-saving in many, many respects. So our aim is to get a complete picture of the child, the entire ecosystem. Right, so uh, I hope I have made certain points regarding how to diagnose. So how to diagnose, we need to delve deep into it. We should not have a checklist approach. We should take time and keep the child at the focus of our evaluation. How not to diagnose differential diagnosis or comorbidity? What are the importance of the above points? I'm going to come next. So let's talk about you know, comorbidity and differential diagnosis. <clears throat> I've already mentioned this, that the differential diagnosis and comorbidity can cause Difficulty in a professional who merely relies on presence of behavioral items on a checklist. Uh, Peter Hill is one of the, Peter Hill and Eric Taylor, and now uh, our very own Indian, you know, fellow colleague, Santosh, uh, they are the three kind of doyens of uh, ADHD in UK. And uh, many of you would know Santosh, he is a PGI alumni who is now in Great Ormond Street, but uh, he is regarded as one of the successors of Peter Hill and Eric Taylor. Uh, but Peter Hill is one of the most renowned authorities of, of ADHD along with Eric Taylor in their generation. 
So I'm just reiterating the same point that we should not just rely on a checklist approach. Oops, there's something wrong. Right. I don't know why it came twice. So, so what are the comorbidity and differential diagnosis? One is a normal variation. An example is that it might be a very tired mother, first pregnancy, four-year-old child, husband is unable to spend much time, the mother is having problems uh, with the in-laws, she might be a working mother. So therefore, the mother feels that the child is hyperactive, cranky, restless, but in fact, it might be just a consequence of the maternal depression. So often, we tell the child, mother that there is actually nothing wrong with the child. So again, going back to my point, not diagnosing is also important, as important as diagnosing ADHD. And there are ICMR studies, uh, which has been done in the outpatient clinics in three centers, I've forgotten which year, it was one of the first ICMR studies which was done on child psychiatry, where they showed that about 30% of children in zero to five age group, which came to these tertiary care uh, <clears throat> centers, child psychiatry OPDs did not have a diagnosis, meaning that they were just normal variations of childhood, which the parents felt that they might be having problems. And in our experience, maternal depression, family conflict, first time mother, overwhelmed mother, parents, they feel that their child is hyperactive. They might have listened to one of your podcasts or one of your TV programs or one of your Facebook posts on how to diagnose a child with ADHD. And they might come and say, doctor, my child has got ADHD because these are the problems which you have listed in your Facebook post and there you go. So again, not diagnosing is equally important. <clears throat> mental retardation, you know, uh, yeah. borderline IQ, mild mental retardation uh, can present with pictures simulating. It might be a comorbidity also. It can be a differential diagnosis also. Consequences of neglect, indulgence, chaotic parenting, <clears throat> We see numerous families, there's enormous indulgence of uh, the child and the child just runs haywire. Uh, basically, he does not have ADHD, but the child has been brought up in an environment where, uh, you know, discipline is not that great. Uh, the fourth point I have already referred to, restlessness, demanding behavior in presence of maternal depression. Undiagnosed sense organ deficits, you know, I have been uh, fooled on a number of times when I did not pick up hearing impairment, visual impairment, and I thought it was, you know, the school complained about ADHD, restless behavior. So I think it is very, very, very important to be mindful of the fact that sense organ deficits can be a differential diagnosis. Conduct disorder obviously is a... Uh, comorbidity or a differential diagnosis, but majority of children with conduct disorder also have ADHD as a comorbidity. <clears throat> Some medications do give rise to phenobarbitone is uh, very famous for producing uh, symptoms mimicking ADHD. Uh, inhalants can often give rise to symptoms like ADHD. Uh, we know that the comorbid rate of emotional disorder is also raised, particularly in girls. Uh, so I think it is very important to address the issue of emotional disorder when a child is not improving and on treatment for ADHD. Uh, it is a very, very common comorbidity which we often miss because we do not see the sadness and anxiety which lies behind the disruptive behavior. Invariably, we have to assess for SLD. And I want to point out that it's not very often as clinicians, we feel very daunted when we are asked to evaluate about um, SLD. Routine certain basic questions regarding
if i ask you this question in which childhood condition symptoms of adhd are present the answer is in all childhood conditions symptoms of adhd are present they are this is like fever you know impulsivity restlessness uh, hyperactivity defines childhood so therefore when we are talking about symptoms of adhd mere presence of those symptoms are not adequate to diagnose adhd that is what my point is so you have to take the family context the developmental level the comorbidity and the differential diagnosis into account before you diagnose a child with adhd because these three symptoms inattention restlessness hyperactivity impulsivity these four or five you know the cardinal three core features of adhd can be present in a wide range of conditions <clears throat> over the last few years really uh, over last five or seven years what has been a real conundrum for us is young people coming to us with problematic internet use i'm using my words very very carefully now because i know that there is a huge amount of controversy about internet addiction internet use and i'm not going into that so i think the safest language to use is problematic internet use what we have seen is that a significant number of children adolescents are primarily brought to us because of this problem they may be 13 or 14 they have been brought to us for problematic internet use and while on evaluation we realize that they also have adhd how do we manage it how do we arrive at a case formulation is very difficult because majority of these adolescents and young people they do not want to give up their gadget use so how do we convince them that come and seek treatment come and go for treat you know come to us for treatment because you also have a comorbid condition how do you convince parents when they are so pissed off thinking that this child is just a naughty kid who just uses gadgets uh, it's a real conundrum but i think we need to be very aware that this is a real problem which we are increasingly facing <clears throat> right so hopefully i have given you some idea about the complexity of the diagnosis and the comorbidity of the diagnosis so now our next job is to how do you unpeel the diagnosis which is what so just kind of forget about whatever we have discussed until now just again go back to the child's life just go back to the family's life so a child is born uh, you know that it's a developmental disorder it's evidenced from right from birth so from 2 to 3 years of age the child would have very difficult early years cranky child colicky child not settling and the mother is kind of overstressed the father may not be able to give time uh, poverty marital conflict so what happens is the mother might be having maternal depression tries authoritarian ways of parenting punitive ways of parenting may be rejecting the child for a child with having who has adhd school is always difficult so the experience in school is not conducive the child is not learning properly so the school experience is not positive and the child gradually feels left out and maybe develops features of oppositional defiant disorder because you are a difficult kid because you are a naughty kid you are bombarded with messages that you are a trouble you are a, you know bad kid you don't know anything so the child develops poor self esteem 
what also happens is these children face greater authoritarian disciplining more punitive parenting punitive disciplining so they don't develop negotiation skills you know so no one talks to them gently no one explains to them that these are the social skills you require in order to go along with your peer group and because these kids they themselves are impulsive by nature they do not have good negotiation skills so what happens they gradually divert towards the antisocial cohort the school dropouts the conduct disordered kids and they are led into antisocial behavior and drugs because of school not being positive school problems school might say you get excluded from school you run away from school you don't attend school school becomes a torturous regime and they again resort to antisocial behavior and drugs so when a child comes to you my request is just step into his shoes and see how his life trajectory has moved so when he is sitting in front of this 56 year old psychiatrist a 13 year old boy what are his life experiences what has he been told about himself what is his idea about school authority parenting friends and how do we unpeel that is methylphenidate adequate to rectify everything you know i i uh, many years ago a 44 year old uh, gentleman who had come to me with alcohol problems marital problems uh, got his son diagnosed by us as having adhd and he then himself said that you know going through the process of evaluation for his son he has realized that he also had adhd and it was never treated and he said that adhd has really screwed up my whole bloody life and he had significant business problems financial problems relationship problems alcohol problems so again it drives home the point that adhd can really mess up your entire life <clears throat> so it's not just a four letter word uh, which has impact on learning it's much more than that <clears throat> right so i think if i go to this point of why you should diagnose correctly i think the answer is obvious isn't it i think correct diagnosis correct unpeeling of the diagnosis is incredibly important otherwise so many lives do not fulfill their actual potential now i said i won't be uh, talking about pharmacotherapy so therefore then it becomes an important question what is the treatment as psychiatrists we can offer apart from psychotherapy what is our rules <clears throat> so again super imposing on the previous slide which i had shown you see what kind of treatment what kind of things which needs to be done so if you have difficult early years you have parenting training programs school is not positive you organize a school counselor there might be family problems marital problems alcohol problems in the family because the father or the mother they might be having adhd and it's uh, you know the consequence of their having adhd might be quite humongous so you might be organizing family therapy for them the child might have poor self esteem negotiation problems cbt social skills training narrative therapy we need to employ for the child while the child is at school apart from school counselor what are the strategies you can use in school to keep the child in school talk to the special educator talk to the school counselor talk to the school teacher talk to the uh, principal of the school the child might be developing antisocial behavior drug problems again try to keep the child in school 
try variety of therapies, pharmacotherapy included, you know, to keep the child away from these problems. So, you know, we need to have a bird's eye view of the child's life and what kind of treatment needs to be fitted in depending on the stage the child is. So, as I said, we need to take a lifespan perspective and the treatment regimen which we are going to offer apart from the pharmacotherapy needs to take into consideration that there are many things which we can do to keep the child in track. I might have some interest in family therapy. I might be doing it. I might have good relationship with the school counselor. So I will use my goodwill to speak to the school counselor, motivate the school counselor to talk to the principal to keep the child in school. I might be seeing some other children from the school and I might tell them that, look, help this guy, you know, help Vinay because he's having problems. Of course, after taking consent, you might be visiting that school. Remember, doctors, psychiatrists still have a great deal of respect in the community, whatever other people say. So if you can act as an advocate of the child and impose some changes in the entire you know ecosystem of the child that would be beneficial so there are many treatment modalities which we can offer which we can provide which we can do which we can supervise even if we are not doing pharmacotherapy and i think this is one of the most important points i want all of you, all trainees, all freshly, you know, postgraduate students to keep in mind that our role does not begin or end with atomoxetine or methylphenidate. It's much bigger than that. <clears throat> I've already kind of spoken about my role, our role. I personally feel that we have multiple roles, you know. We, are, we can act as a counselor, we can act as a liaison officer, we can act as an advocate, we can act as a therapist, we can act as a uh, you know, representative of the family to the uh, school governing body. You know, we have many, many roles apart from that of a psychiatrist who is just prescribing medicines for the child. And I think we will do, you know, failing in our duty if we do not realize these are the roles which we can play and really help the child and really help the family. Because remember, ADHD is a lifelong condition and these children, they will stay with you. They will stay with you. <clears throat> uh, final two couple of slides. What is the role of psychometry? And should you know about psychometry? As I said, I think I am, these are my last two slides. Oh, fantastic. We have a lot of time for discussion. See, the role of psychometry, I feel, mm, is important because IQ evaluation is important. Getting a baseline idea about the ADHD, uh, mild, moderate, severe uh, is important. We do a lot of VABs in order to get a more holistic impression about the child. SLD evaluation is again very important uh, because if we miss out on the SLD bit, which is about 30% of children with ADHD present with also have SLD, then treatment progress with uh, other therapies, pharmacotherapy will not happen. Uh, Rarely you might have to do uh, some projective tests, CAT or, you know, uh, tests like that in order to know the emotional problems that the child is not uh, engaging with you. But routinely, a cognitive function assessment, SLD assessment is very, very important to have a holistic view of the child. And if possible, uh, we do it in majority of our children who can afford uh, afford it. So 
should you know about psychometry i feel it's an overwhelming yes because if we do not know about psychometry we will not be able to ask the right questions to the our clinical psychology colleagues and also we will not be able to guide the special educator in school we will not be able to guide the school counselor so therefore we have to know bits about the psychometry what is it used for what kind of tests are done what are the significance of those tests we really can't just leave it uh, in the hands of uh, clinical psychologists because we will not then be able to do justice to the treatment thank you Right. I hope. Uh, am I? Can I just switch off? I knew I need to switch on my lights because it's too dark. Yes. Yes. Just I give me. I. 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 I yeah. didn't understand. Just give me one minute. Yeah. A little bit more, and we wonder if we have the Blair Witch Project or something. You know? <laughs> My apologies, because when I started, it was bright sunlight in my room, so I thought, you know. Yeah. No, no worries, no worries, no worries. Uh, well, uh, as expected, quite quite an articulate and quite a pertinent and yet uh, down to the basics kind of uh, discourse, which which gives us a ground views, uh, a ground ground level perspective rather than a top-down perspective from an overly scientific point of view. So it's a very clinically relevant and uh, uh, pertinent uh, uh, topic and uh, I think Dr. Ram has done really good justice to it. Uh, we have quite a few participants and uh, contrary to your belief, Dr. Ram, we have quite a few senior consultants who chose to join in today and be a part of this discussion as well. I, I was uh, hoping about 15 or 16, so I asked Birva, so she said I think about 40, so I think there's about 100, so which is... Oh, we have had 100 and plus, 100 plus people, but we have quite a few consultants as well, so you are more popular than you give yourself credit for. <laughs> uh, I'm in scared fact, uh, uh, In fact, it's, I see in the chat box, uh, there's a Dr. Jinesh Shah, who is a part of our uh, discourse tonight. He's also an MRC psych uh, from UK and CCT in child and adolescent psychiatry and he has shifted to India uh, to Ahmedabad after 17 years so well so more the merrier uh, so far we haven't had any questions on the chat box uh, barring a few uh, ADHD can be diagnosed in adults about the age of 18 years is a question which Dr. Jayesh has uh, asked about uh, your comments Dr. Ram yeah it can be you know uh, as you know, Dr. Shah would know. DSM has recently changed their uh, protocol or guidance about that, isn't it? Because I think it right. is now until the age of 12. Uh, you know, I personally feel that we grossly underdiagnose adult ADHD and they come to us in this very mix of ragtag of loads of problems. One of our crucial problems, and there are adult ADHD scales, which my clinical psychology colleagues use. But uh, I have found that getting a proper developmental history from their parents is virtually impossible because most of these adults come on their own and they present with very severe, what would I say, behavioral issues, you know, or... Uh, alcohol problems, uh, failed relationships, and they're always written off as outcasts. So, right. but in my own experience, so the answer is yes, it can be diagnosed. Uh, my own experience of treatment, though, has been quite disappointing. I'm quite uh, gung-ho about giving them methylphenidate, giving them atomoxetine, but somehow the response is not as good as you know, at least some other people, experts say. 
Hmm. Sure, uh, I couldn't agree more. And uh, adult ADHD is a conundrum for all of us. We've seen a lot of patients who have been misdiagnosed uh, with multiple other uh, ailments and treated with everything from antipsychotics to sodium valproate to everything because they assume it was a behavioral problem. Uh, sometimes it's also misdiagnosed having an impulse control issue, which in a way it is. In, in that sense, ADHD is an impulse control uh, spectrum Absolutely. disorder. Yeah. So, yeah. yes. Uh, but uh, they have often been misdiagnosed or uh, either not diagnosed at all. They very often present to us with uh, issues of uh, not being able to sustain their performance at work, having challenges with relationships because uh, their social skills are uh, definitely left wanting uh, despite their intellectual skills compensating for their attention deficit or their hyperactivity. Uh, so yeah, that's a problem. That's definitely a problem. And, uh, I feel that, you know, treating them is, uh, you know, the other medicine which I use quite regular. you know, what I do is I don't use uh, atomoxetine or dialphenidate right at the beginning. I use a lot of modafinil. My friends in Kolkata yes. have said that uh, you use a lot of modafinil and I try and see whether it, it helps. In some it does. If it doesn't, then I go on to uh, atomoxetine next and then methylphenidate if I am very brave. I have, with limited degree of success, used uh, bupropion in quite a few of these adult ADHDs, and they do reasonably well, some of them at least. Mm -hmm. Particularly the ones who have impulsivity as a major issue as opposed to the attention deficit. I don't think the attention deficit part is ever going to go away. They're probably saddled with it for the rest of their life. They have to simply find ways to work their way around it and come up with coping mechanisms and strategies. So I don't know what your experience is along those lines, but that's something that we've seen very often. So the other category, which I must, you know, I, it brings back, I'm glad that you, Dr. Shah, asked this question. Again, in Mumbai, it will be a very common experience. Many of the students who have gone abroad, you know, to USA or UK to study, hmm. uh, they come back on their holidays and say that we have got ADHD. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> oh, yes. We took some drugs. My friends uh, have ADHD. We took this, that you know, Dexedrine or Adderall and all that. Adderall seems to be a favorite. And can you prescribe uh, it to us? So then <laughs> these 19, 20 year olds who are very street smart, they know all about ADHD. Their parents won't let us diagnose as having ADHD. And we are in a real pickle, you know, what to do with these kids. So uh, often uh, because they have used and read, used uh, methylphenidate or Adderall in UK or USA uh, using their friends and they have read up about the symptoms. You know, if you do give them a checklist, they will take all the right boxes. <laughs> yeah, true, 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 true. At one point, I almost believe that everybody who does their MS in computer science has a adult ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> so, because what you said is so true. Almost all of them who would go to their MS and come back and say, Doctor, I was given this drug that I'm doing very good. And very often, we realize that they were simply just abusing the drug because they enjoyed the high. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, and they are very keen that if we prescribe them uh, a stimulant, you know, they are not happy yes. with, uh, they are not yes. happy with uh, atomoxity. They want a methylphenidate. Yeah. Uh, because we do not have the other amphetamine derivatives here. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody has also asked us, Dr. Varsha Vijay, can you elaborate a little bit on problematic internet use and how to I, counsel them? <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw that and I'm hoping that it gets lost in the, uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm equally at sea. I'm equally at sea regarding using this. Um, uh, I feel, see, my point of bringing this up was that if you think of all the children who are brought to us or adolescents who are brought to us with problematic internet use, they're already labeled and, you know, chastised and they are bad and difficult kids because parents have tried everything hmm. to move the gadget away and they have been extremely violent. Majority of these children are quite violent actually also and very impulsive. Right. So they are brought against their consent. 
Now, if you enter the child's mind, the child sees that I have come to Dr. Jairanjan Ram and his job is to take away the laptop or the computer from or the mobile from me. So he's not going to engage with me. So what are the chances of success? So the way we approach it, you know, is we have to be very respectfully curious. You know, that is the phrase we use in order to engage the child. <clears throat> and here, a lot of our knowledge about adolescent worlds, you know, so K-pop, PUBG, PUBG has been banned, but computer games and stuff. So that we also show an interest in the child's life, what the child is doing, and gradually engage the child in a conversation to elicit whether he has ADHD, whether they have uh, emotional disorder, whether he has some peer group difficulties, what is happening, which is making the child focus only on the internet away from the outside world. So it is a complex process. It requires a quite a lot of time and patience. And remember, the parents are very keen on a quick result that they somehow want the gadget to be moved away. They are not interested in your fancy case formulation. So therefore, it's a difficult area to tricky area, uh, requires a lot of patience, lot of counseling. But again, my request is to keep the child at the center of the intervention and respect why the child is doing it. Sure. Uh, Dr. Kanayambar has a question. Uh, uh, ADHD after 18, it can be an adjustment disorder? Absolutely. Many, many children with ADHD do have adjustment problems. So, and if I'm having difficulty in adjusting to my new hostel, new, uh, you know, city, I might not be paying attention. So therefore, I'm glad that you asked the question. So therefore, adjustment disorder might also give rise to inattention, low mood, dysphoria, uh, anger outbursts, impulsivity. So therefore, adjustment problems might mimic as ADHD. Uh, in children who are slightly older. And we have seen a lot of kids who have been sent away to boarding schools uh, because their father or parents have been moving or something and they don't kind of do well in studies and the school counselor has diagnosed as ADHD and we find it's an emotional disorder. On the other hand, uh, aren't ADHD kids, uh, uh, the elderly ones particularly, more likely to have adjustment disorders as comorbidities? Absolutely. It's a both way. It's a both way. It's, it's a both way. Uh, Dr. Sharmishta uh, has a question. Do you think it is overdiagnosed or underdiagnosed? I think it is, you know, hand on my heart, it is underdiagnosed. Hand on my heart, it is underdiagnosed. At least in India. At least in India. There's a lot of studies, yes. as you would know from USA, that the black kids, poor kids, uh, kids who are Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Americans, they are more diagnosed and there is this conspiracy theory that you are drugging the kid, you know, but I personally feel that we, how many ADHDs are there in the community and how many do we see? So I think it is underdiagnosed. Some Indian studies have indicated figures as high as 7 to 9 percent, if I'm not mistaken, isn't it? Yeah. So that's, that's definitely an issue. Uh, Sharmishta also goes on to ask, uh, as, as you said, some parents are in denial saying I was also like him at his age. Why does he need treatment when I'm an engineer and doing so well in life? So it keeps coming back to MS in computer science. But <laughs> 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 uh, what, what do you say to that? Because that's, uh, I'm glad. Sure. See, you know, I have seen that if you Indian parents for right or wrong, if you sell them, the concept of poor school performance and therefore your child needs intervention. I think they are, most often they are sold on that. Yeah, they have you that. that. That yes, you you are, uh, you know, you, you did well, but the environment has changed. It's a far more competitive world. And therefore, let us help you to help the child. So, you know, we often grovel. I have no shame in you know, acting as an advocate for the child and grov groveling to the parents, even if I'm inwardly, I'm seething, you know, that uh, the parent is. But I think, again, we need to explain to the <clears throat> parents that the times are different. Uh, mm -hmm. There might be more adverse consequences. See, the child has been brought to us 
because of such problems. And often the school has referred to us and the parents do not agree. The parents do not agree that the child has a problem. And then the parents pose such questions that uh, why is the school kind of overreacting? Uh, I also was like this. And then we have to tell the parents that, look, we have to work with the school. Uh, let us help the child to remain in school and achieve his full potential. And we are also acting in the best interest of the child. So, you know, let us take things slowly and not kind of reject the whole idea that the child doesn't have any problems. So, uh, Dr. Tanabar goes on to ask, uh, is oxcarbamazepine quite effective in ADHD? I haven't, um, yeah, that's an, I personally, I haven't used oxcarbamazepine, you know. Um, I'm not a great oxcarbamazepine user. I'm more kind of carbamazepine if required. I can see uh, Dr. Shottuji Tash in the uh, program. He is a great believer in carbamazepine, but uh, I, I don't use oxcarbamazepine to that degree. Yeah, so my own experience is very limited. Really. So I, I, I echo your thoughts completely. Uh, Milan uh, uh, says, I prefer ways to demonstrate they don't have ADHD works most of the time or is it as a psychiatrist? I do not know in what context is this question, but I have to just look at it as a comment. Uh, Himangi yeah. says, if child has only attention problem and no hyperactivity, then which drug is better? Atomoxetine or methyl phenylate? You know, uh, there is a lot of studies uh, which uh, I'm glad this question. See, Pharmacotherapy of ADHD has differential effects on different components of ADHD. And what we know is, at least for methylphenidate, the hyperactivity component is most well, you know, um, addressed. So it's not that the all three components of ADHD are equally improved with uh, the two drugs. So therefore, uh, if the child only has inattention, uh, the gold, you know, the gold standard treatment anyway is methylphenidate. The effect size is better. So therefore, I personally use methylphenidate, but I know that often inattention is more common in girls and they have a comorbidity of uh, emotional disorder. And we know that if we use methylphenidate in comorbid emotional disorders and ADHD, the response is not great. So then we may be tempted to use atomoxetine. So it's a matter of clinical judgment, but it's a very important point. I'm glad that uh, you asked that question because inattention, often we have these quiet, lonely girls who kind of uh, present only with inattention. Emotional disorder is very you know, common in these children and response to methylphenidate is not that great. Again, literature supports that. Sure. Well, we also have to bear in mind the possibility that uh, very often these young girls may have a mood disorder, like say depression, and they might have cognitive deficits on account of the mood disorder, which may be misconstrued or perhaps uh, given more weight in terms of attention deficit, wherein it might yes. just be a mood disorder and induced cognitive deficit. Uh, uh, then uh, Milin also asked, what test do you suggest for self-diagnosis of ADHD? There is an adult uh, ADHD checklist which uh, we use. Uh, I'm not yes. sure exactly which, yeah, but uh, our clinical psychologist colleagues, they use uh, um, Adult, uh, there's an adult checklist which we use, but we are, uh, you know, we always try and get back to the parents, and there we have a great difficulty. You know, to be honest, uh, I don't fight a lot with uh, young people who come with uh, wanting to diagnose themselves at ADHD. I give them a trial, and if it doesn't help, you know, most adolescents or young people they stop treatment. So therefore, we recently had someone, uh, a guy who is now stuck in Kolkata because he's not able to go back. He was convinced, he's a DJ, he studies music and, you know, uh, abuses a lot of cannabis. And he said that 
I'm absolutely convinced that I have got ADHD. Hmm. Uh, so please give me uh, methylphenidate because that has helped. Uh, we had great trouble in convincing parents uh, that their son could be having ADHD. We did all the battery of assessments. He filled the, he ticked the right boxes. And then we went ahead and gave him uh, methylphenidate, Concerta actually, the long acting. Right. And, and he said that ah, it's, it's not working. I said, look boss, then it's, it's not. There must be something else which we need to evaluate you for. And he dropped out of me. What is your experience with dextroamphetamine? We don't have it here, but then... We don't, I don't, I have... In the, in the, yeah. Have you ever had the opportunity of having a, one of these engineers come from abroad who have used dextroamphetamine and then they use methylphenidate, any kind of... You know, a, I, you know, Adderall, is, I think Adderall is the go-to drug for in USA. You know, most people, they want right. Adderall. So we don't have that. So... Dextroamphetamine, so we it's don't a have methylphenidate and we don't have dextroamphetamine. So it's kind of a... Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the advantages, either. Rashminov, you know, there's this curious fact about dextroamphetamine. Uh, dextroamphetamine, that the license for dextroamphetamine to be used in UK is three years. Whereas for methylphenidate, it's six years. So okay. this, uh, it's a strange thing, you know, so the license, so, yes. you can, so if you just think, why like, you can use dexamphetamine in a, I think I'm right in saying this, but I have to check the BNF again, but I think the licensing age is three years in for dexamphetamine. Uh, this is a very interesting question, which probably even I myself would like to know from my colleague, Dr. Riddhi, who is here with me. Uh, is there a different approach for ADHDs with high intelligence versus ADHDs with low intelligence? And how does one direct their energy in a one-to-one -one session with these kids? See, ADHD with high IQ, it's, it is one of the great kind of discussion and debate points in our team, really, because we often see very bright kids who are very... Uh, you know, who are obviously very bright. They are 15 year olds and they have read uh, uh, Harari and they have read Karl Sagan and they know all about kind of the cosmos. And, and mind you, they are not kind of uh, autistic kids. They are really well read. Uh, but they are not performing well in their school because they are simply disinterested. Now, having a high intelligence doesn't rule out you not having ADHD. So that is the first point. So we need to do a complete evaluation. Uh, many of these kids, if we can engage them in a conversation and try and help them to focus more, often many of them are bored with their studies. Then they said that this Indian study system and the usual things, you know, which says that it is rote learning. Why should I do this? Why I want to do kind of greater and bigger things. So I think treatment wise, we would have to use a different approach because often they are quite skeptical and rejecting in our hypothesis uh, because they have been brought against their consent. So the conversation needs to be of a different level. Uh, <clears throat> so that is number one. And we need to take a lot more frequent feedback about the medication response from them. That is what I have learned. And I have seen the majority of children, they do respond well and they do perform well and they are less impulsive and disrespectful of their teachers in class if they are on methylphenidate. But you need to give them a large degree of you know, control that you decide um, when you want to take the medicine, which teacher, so stuff like that. So I think the approach has to be different. I don't know whether that answers Ritik's question. Uh, what was so high? Uh, right. A gentleman who goes by the pen name of J.R. Syke uh, says that, uh, is it appropriate to say that ADHD is a spectrum disorder? Yes, How yes. do you formulate and manage a case with spectrum disorder? <laughs> yeah, ADHD is a spectrum and it's a lifespan thing. You know, the, the things, yes. uh, uh, the status changes. Status changes because... Many children, as they grow older, uh, often have developed the oppositional uh, picture, comorbid oppositional defined disorder, 
they start abusing drugs, they are more reckless, uh, and their physical impulsivity then becomes a problem because in a See, impulsivity in a five-year-old and an impulsivity in a 15-year-old who is driving a bike or trying to, uh, you know, smoke from, from cannabis is very different, has got a very different connotation. So therefore, many of these children whom we see for five, 10, uh, 15 years, our approach with them, with them has to change. And uh, as I said in my previous one of those slides, we need to put in the different modalities of treatment uh, changing over a period of time to respect the differences in presentation. Thank you. Dr. Rithvik Chatterjee has a question for us. Uh, severe hyperactivity in the very young children who are less than six years. There's non-availability of uh, non-pharmacological resources. What meds would you prefer? Um, you know, I often use uh, methylphenidate, you know, in very, very low doses. Uh, the caveat is the response is not that good. So, you know, uh, one particular brand is available in 5mg. I, I try in 2.5 and if the child is four and a half or five, I try very low doses of methylphenidate. Uh, unfortunately, the side effects are more, the response is not great. Uh, the child often becomes very cranky, but I try. If that fails, and I have been quite criticized by my teachers, particularly Shobha Srinath, who uh, has just retired, uh, mm. I use tiny doses of uh, risperidone, uh, two mm. to three drops, yes. four to five drops, because otherwise this child is completely unmanageable. In fact, Shobha yes. Srinath called me out in a conference where you know, when we are talking, he said, Jay, why do you use so much of risperidone in, a, uh, in young children? You shouldn't do it. So I groveled and said, I'm sorry, ma'am, and all that. But uh, as Ritik has pointed out, you know, there are many situations where parenting programs, clinical psychologists, they are not available. It's not practical. So therefore, we do have to kind of use something. Uh, clonidine. Uh, in fact, the mm -hmm. Nihan's favorite in such age group is clonidine. clonidine yes. Somehow, I'm not, you know, clonidine produces sedation. I'm not sure whether it reduces hyperactivity to the extent we would like it to. But I would like to hear from other people also. Uh, under six, what do you use? My go to drug is very low doses of reserve, very low doses of methylphenidate. If that doesn't work, I will try very low doses of uh, risperidone till we are able to manage something better. A very out and out question. Uh, nowadays, nobody uses it anymore, but way back in my residency days, it was one of the options for ADHD when we didn't have methylphenidate and neither did we have atomoxifen. Imipramine in very, very low doses? Imipramine, you know, I. I'm not very confident about using Ipramine and no, I don't. I, the short answer is I don't. I don't use Ipramine. I will go to Risperidone and maybe even very low doses of, uh, for, in fact, for, uh, in fact, for very young children, I don't use Aripiprazole unless they have comorbid uh, autism spectrum disorder. I think uh, Aripiprazole liquid drops would be great. You know, uh, Santosh, uh, whom I referred to earlier, who is now a professor of psychopharmacology in uh, Great Ormond Street, they recommend very tiny, uh, in UK, uh, uh, aripiprazole liquid is available. So they use very tiny drops of uh, aripiprazole in such situations. And atomoxetin in very, very young kids? No, really. No, because it takes about six to eight weeks to work and those adjustment and it's a long term. No, I have. Yeah. Rithvik also goes on to ask, for the case of diagnosed ADHD comes in adulthood with inattention, what pharmacological treatment would you prefer? That, because uh, you already answered it partly, but nonetheless. Where I, uh, how do you gauge response to treatment? Is that the one or? Uh, no, no. So he, he says that what pharmacological treatment would you use for a case who's... Uh, oh, yeah, adulthood. Was... Adulthood. Yeah. Uh, adulthood, you know, I said I, I would uh, initially use my first go-to drug is modafinil, then atomoxetine, then uh, methylphenidate. 
uh, how do you gauge response to treatment and which clinical bedside test would you recommend for an objective assessment of response? Again, Ritwik asks us that. Uh, you know, bets, I would, uh, parents, whether I, I ask some simple questions that do you feel his concentration has improved? He's able to sit more quietly, number one. I ask the child that do you feel less restless? Do you feel a bit calmer? And surprise, surprise, about 90% of children just shrug and say no, uh, no difference. Uh, and then I would try and get a response from school. Uh, so then I ask the child, have your marks improved? Are you doing better? Are you able to copy the board more completely? You know, are you doing more things within a shorter span of time? So I try and convince to the child that it is helping. And parents often focus on two things. One is grades and marks and uh, this impulsivity, you know, not hitting the uh, grandmother, not hitting the sister listening quietly, not interrupting the mother while she is cooking. So parental report is pretty easy. Uh, convincing the child that uh, it is benefiting is a bit more difficult. <clears throat> Vishal, uh, Dr. Vishal Savani has a question. What, up to what doses would you usually prescribe if as monotherapy? Now, I don't know which drug is he talking about, but uh, uh, just a regular question uh, in the context of every drug, maybe you can touch upon each drug that you use. Yeah. In you the know, same you context, Cheryl John asks us, what is the appropriate dose for clonidine? So probably an extension of the same. Yeah, clonidine, I'm not, uh, doctor, I'm not a great fan of clonidine. You know, um, I possibly use maximum three tablets, you know, of 100 micrograms. And if it doesn't, maximum, I start very low and go up. Uh, ADHD, I would only use for ADHD earlier when melatonin was not available, I would use it for sleep. Uh, I'm not a great user of clonidine as some other people are. Uh, for <coughs> methylphenidate, the recommended dose, maximum dose is about 60. Uh, in India, I have hardly gone up to 60 majority of children respond pretty well about 85 percent 90 percent respond very well to uh, 30 to 40 dose range very rarely we have had to go up to 60 or 80 which was not my experience earlier in united kingdom uh, for concerta the maximum dose the usual dose uh, is found at about 36 mg very rarely 72 mg and for atomoxidine, I usually go up to 1.2 milligram per kg body weight. Uh, I, I, you know, I, on a routine basis, I go up to 1 milligram or 1.2 milligram uh, per kg body weight. I'm not very confident that it works. I don't know that it, whether it works in a reduced dose or not. Right. I think uh, for methylphenidate, we would normally go by that kind of gradation uh, as well, about 0.75 milligrams per kg body weight was the standard formula we would apply. In very severe cases, up to 1, 1.2. Yeah. You know, Rashmin, uh, uh, um, we have had this discussion within our friend circle. I don't go by the milligram per kg body weight. You know, I usually start at 5 mg BD, uh, then maybe 5 mg, then mg then 10 mg and 5 mg so i increase it by 5 mg and that and if you know the person who has influenced me to think like that is eric taylor uh, he writes a great deal about psychopharmacology of adhd and he is of the view that actually milligram per kg body weight dosage is perhaps not the right way and i was greatly influenced by his kind of because you know he, when i was training in uk he was the popular voice but a very close friend of mine, uh, in fact, Abir, whom many of you would know, Dr. Mukherjee, he uses a milligram per kg body weight, but I don't. I start with 5 mg BD, then 10 mg and 5 mg, and gradually titrate the dose. No, I, I concur with you completely. I'm talking about the maximum dose. Uh, maximum uh, dose again is dose response. I would go up to right. you know, hardly. I, I can remember, I can count on my fingers how many times I have to go above 40 mg. Okay. Uh, Nidhi asks us, uh, what is your suggestions for patients having a dual diagnosis of ADHD and OCD? ADHD and OCD, you know, in uh, high functioning autism, this becomes a problem. They have uh, 
we see a, for some strange reason we see a lot of uh, high functioning autism uh, and there this adhd and ocd simultaneously exists we use both drugs we would use treat adhd separately OD, uh, ocd separately so we don't kind of uh, you know Right. And then Dr. Rashna asked what would be the drug or choice uh, in preschoolers and what those works well. I think we probably already answered yeah, I, that. Can I just, yeah, can I just say that preschoolers, we must try and not, uh, you know, we have to be conscious of the fact that uh, we sh really should not be gung-ho about using the drugs. And please do read that article, Halpern, which I have said on JCPP. Uh, 2019, which gives a good framework. If we are stuck, then as I said, very tiny doses of risperidone. I'm not sure whether I should be saying this, but... Uh, no, 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 it is what it is. This is not uh, no, a formal uh, kind of a yeah, true, thing. True. Your opinion. Very, uh, very Priya, good. Dr. Priyanka Pandey asks us, what is the youngest age group you have diagnosed and treated with ADHD? Can I just, as a counterpoint, can I just say the dangers of using uh, risperidone in young children that there is a definitely a certain amount of literature which shows that it impairs learning. So I think we have to be mindful of that fact. Right. Right. Uh, <clears throat> that it is definitely impairs learning and at least that's what my reading is. Now, one of the biggest problems of my using uh, Risperidone in children comes when I think about this fact that it impairs learning when I'm treating treatment resistant OCD. <clears throat> so you have many situations where the child has responded well to say 40 or 60 mg of uh, fluoxetine uh, along with 2 mg of uh, risperidone and the child is reasonably okay. And at the back of my mind, there are these studies and people have, you know, I have read that risperidone impairs learning. So then what do I do? Right. So that is something I think we need to read a bit more and formulate our own hypothesis. But again, as a caveat to my mentioning uh, risperidone in very young children, please be mindful of the fact that there is some literature that it impairs learning. So we should not be go ahead and kind of just give, you know, risperidone. Having said Sorry. that, I mean, the impact of ADHD directly on uh, a hampered learning has to be kind of looked at in balance in terms of what harm risperidone can possibly do. So it's a question of choosing the lesser of the two yeah. evils and perhaps risperidone might still win it, you know. True. No, that's a good counterpoint. I haven't thought of it like that. No, that's a very valid point. Thank you. Yeah. And that's a uh, great. I think uh, we could go on and on, but uh, we have imposed on your time long enough, uh, Dr. Ram, and uh, I'm very grateful to you for having taken the time and uh, for all of you who have taken the time out and joined us today. And uh, uh, again, I, I ask all of you to join me in thanking Dr. Jairam for having uh, spared us a few moments of his precious time and uh, given us very valuable, very, very ground level, uh, clinical, uh, community oriented insights into ADHD and its management and helped change our perspective a little bit. So thank you very much. And we hope to have you back for a few more discourses in the future. And uh, I thank you all for having joined us and please be in touch with us. We continue to uh, endeavor to bring you such kind of interesting topics for our postgraduate students. Learning is a lifelong process and uh, we learn and we teach simultaneously. So we hope that uh, we continue to have our interactions and uh, I again take the opportunity to thank, thank Sun Pharma for having helped put this together. They have been our knowledge partners through and through uh, for the past five years that we have been having this uh, lecture series going on. So thank you again, and uh, thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks. Thank thanks you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmin. Thank you. Thanks for all bye. the. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.